What's up, Coordination? How you doing? On the pod today, we have Peter, who's going to talk about Upala. Upala is a protocol that creates civil resistance on chain. More specifically, it sort of aggregates identity systems and then creates a crypto economic game where any user can consume their identity and add it to a blacklist in exchange for some amount of reward. And what this does from a crypto economic perspective is that it starts to play with this idea of, of price of forgery. So basically price of forgery of a, of a digital identity is sort of an upper bound on the economic gains that you could attach to that identity in a civil resistance type of system. And in this episode, we talk about Upalo. What is what is it? Why Peter got so into civil resistance, how Gitcoin Passport and Upalo could be interoperable, and what is the beautiful vision of a coordinating world that is going to be created by Upalo digital identity systems. So this episode is a little bit technical and into the weeds. If you're deep on civil resistance, then I think that you're going to enjoy it. If you are not, then it might be one that well, it's up to your judgment whether or not it's for you or not. But I think the upside of civil resistance and digital identity is quite big. That's why we're doing a whole season on regenerative society. So I hope that you enjoy this episode with Peter from Upala. Immutable X is the layer two platform for crypto gaming. Immutable offers massive scalability with up to 9,000 transactions per second and instant transaction confirmation. No more gas fees, no more waiting around for your transaction to clear. Immutable's zero knowledge roll up finally unlocks the world of crypto gaming. Immutable X is the only gas free NFT minting platform with over 26 million NFTs minted, all with zero gas fees. With the power of Immutable, gaming developers don't also need to become smart contract developers, they just need to plug in to Immutable's API and instant instantly start unlocking the full potential of crypto assets inside of games. This is why world-class companies and projects have decided to deploy on Immutable X like GameStop, Ember Sword, Planet Quest, Alluvium, TikTok, and many more behind the scenes. So start building your game on Immutable X today at immutable.com. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses who need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage their treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the extremely secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive single-chain treasuries to expressive, flexible, multi-chain features such as global user management, global contracts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization. CoinShift layers on powerful treasury management tools on top the proven security of Gnosis Safe, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Mazari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. In DeFi, you have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. Hey, Peter. How's it going? Hey, Kevin. Doing great. So excited to have you on the show to talk about Apollo today. Can you tell me why civil resistance matters for you? Uh, well, uh, I started this idea as um, one of the things that is super important for peace. And, mm. and now it became real, even more important. So I have this crazy idea that small people can coordinate um, and mm. that small people can have real power against their own governments. Because, You're saying my magic word, coordination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. But, but why civil resistance? So basically the idea is that civil resistance is important for coordination in some way? Yes. Yeah, so civil resistance is like, like close, super closely knit with digital identity and unique human. So if we are talking about creating real decentralized digital identity that is a substitute for government IDs, so we just automatically talk about civil resistance. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the way I've been saying it is that civil resistance enables a whole ecosystem of one human, one vote DAOs, quadratic voting, quadratic funding, genie, genie coefficient measurements, UBI, like, like talking about the the... Uh, use cases that it enables is my way of talking about the why, and then you can get back to the what, which is the digital identity. So I don't know how does that how does that resonate with you? Yeah, totally. Uh, I I'd also uh, would say that this is just just a very very tip, the very the, the highest tip of the iceberg, mm. because having a real digital identity on blockchain, like um, 
unlocks uh, digital governments, which is a super powerful thing. We can't even imagine, I think, right now, what are the, all the advantages of this transition. We already have Bitcoin right. and digital currencies, which like break government monopolies on currencies, on money. Mm. And, and the other big monopoly of governments is identity. So we can try and uh, break mm. this monopoly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sort of come to it from an angle of what's the utility that could be brought to end users with digital identity systems. And for me, you know, I mentioned all of those things. Uh, and, and um, you know, I think there's two ways of coming at it. There's breaking the monopoly of governments, which is more the cypherpunk way of saying it. And then the solar yeah. punk way of saying it is how do we coordinate better? How do we mm -hmm. give, give value to public goods? And um, you know, it's interesting to hear it from your side. Uh, where you're coming from so 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 let's pull the thread more tell us about your founding of uh upala like what, what does upala mean what does it do what you what are you trying to do with it um uh, like uh are we talking about the whole protocol or just the word upala <laughs> yeah let's like, it, it, let's let's start in wherever feels natural for for you and then let's let's cover all those things eventually okay um yeah i i would just i think that's uh like Cool to mention that Upala means a precious stone. It's a Sanskrit word. Um, and specifically an opal, uh, which is like a beautiful stone with intricate, in, intricate structure inside. And I think that's a analogy of a human society. So it's beautiful. We all knit together. Mm. Uh, we all of us are friends. Um, no human is a like and yeah there is nothing against uh, one another when just single people meet each other so yeah that's an opal that's a, a beautiful beautiful thing. it reminds me of yeah. like po positive some games that we could create with, yeah. with coordination yeah. and and having it instantiated as a gem is is sort of a beautiful way of of thinking about it yeah and also uh Opala logo and opal uh, around a, a spherical opal looks like Earth. So that's another beautiful like thing to decide. Right. Beautiful. So, so, <laughs> so, so take us further down the rabbit hole. Uh, Upala, how does it deliver civil resistance? So uh, it doesn't actually uh, provide civil resistance. It uh, now I tend to start explaining Opala more in terms of quality control of human verification method methods. So Opala is like a, a layer above any other human verification method or in, in perfect world, uh, in my perfect world, <laughs> all of them, uh, so that it can quality control different human verification methods and combine them under single standard of price of forgery. Uh, like here, uh, let's segue to this price of forgery uh, term. Term. So, what Upala basically provides is this uh, price of forgery uh, what is a parameter of a human verification method. So, with Upala, we can assess how much does it cost to forge an account uh, of a human who passed like several or one human verification method. And the protocol does that through market dynamics. Right. So it's a way of sort of aggregating on top of digital identity systems and then generating a crypto economic game that guarantees a certain amount of cost of forgery for an, ide for an identity. Um, I want to dig in on the cost of forgery there. Why cost of forgery? Like, why not? Why not just say this user is si a civil attacker or or not? Uh, why is cost of forgery such an important primitive in the system? Uh, like that's that's the major feature, main feature of Upala, this price of forgery. Uh, and cool thing about it is that it's not binary, of course. Uh, no, I mean, one of the cool things is that it's, it is not binary and 
why it is it is non-binary and why it is so cool is that it is derived by market forces. So there is no algorithm behind Upala. There is only this incentive and all the rest is on the market. Uh, so just just a couple of words of how on how price of forgery even works. Uh, so yeah, well, so Upala consists of groups. Uh, you can also say that a group is formed around a human verification method. So uh, let, let's say we are a group manager and we create an Upala group around SMS verification. Uh, then we say that uh, any person who passes SMS verification can access that group and can get a score within that group. And the manager sets that score. And for example, for SMS verification, let's say we say that uh, the score is $1. So everyone who's who passed SMS verification gets the $1 score within that group. From then, uh, we see uh, the so-called explosions uh, or liquidations. Upala protocol allows anyone who passed into a group to liquidate their ID for an amount of money equal to their score. So in our case, if someone got into SMS verification group with $1 score, they can get away, get, uh, get out of it and get their $1 for like breaking, so to say, the verification method. Uh, and from here, we can start discovering by changing this score at at what at what cost at what at what score users get into that group just for the money. Uh, if we start with one dollar and see that there is not many users coming in, uh, we can assume that we can safely increase the score a bit. And then we do it. And if we don't see explosions or liquidations again, uh, liquidations, we can increase it again. Uh, and so this way we, for example, come up with a score of $5 for anyone who passes SMS verification. And at this point, it turns out that we attracted a lot of bots. So they start, uh, so they, they start re passing SMS verification just for is five dollars and mm. then we need to decrease the price so this way we come gradually come up with the real market uh, price of forgery for the sms verification right. so so let me say back to you what i heard in and i'll summarize for the listener and i'm curious if i if i got it mostly right so the reason why we center off cost of forgery is that uh, the web is an adversarial game. There's the red team, there's the blue team and the red team, like people are always going to be basically trying to forge identities. If there's going to be rewards on the other side of having that identity, but you've got a spectrum of sophisticatedness of your attackers all the way from script kitties, which maybe just downloaded some script to forge something to organize crime, which is maybe more sophisticated. They're producing software to nation states like North Korea. And so the cost of forgery to keep each of these baddies out is different. And the way that you do that with Apollo is that you've built a crypto economic game where people can build an identity through uh, various identity systems. And then there's like a honeypot where they can consume that identity and get the cost, or get that value. So like if I've verified with SMS, just to use your example, and Apollo thinks that SMS has a $5 cost of forgery, then I can always consume that identity and get $5 back. And therefore we know crypto economically that 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 verification mechanism has about that much of cost of forgery because if it was more then the user would have consumed it already it, it, am i getting close at all anywhere you want to correct me uh, on that summary yeah i think that that is correct uh we have single uh, uh, price of forgery for all users so it's okay if someone doing it manually or someone doing it um 
like with some sophisticated software. We assume that uh, it, it doesn't matter. And uh, actually, okay. group manager will decide what rate of liquidations they can bear. So that could be, for example, like mm. 10 people a day, or it's a thousand people a day. So 10, I, I think 10, 10 maybe so there should be some, some limit because people maybe get hacked or I don't know, just, just making mistakes. So we need to have this limit. Right. Okay. Got it. So, uh, I think I, I was just summarizing what you had told me and then, uh, you know, I'm curious what's next in your presentation, you know, take us further down the, the Upalo rabbit hole. So this, this primitive, this price of forgeries, uh, thing allows for mul multiple, uh, multiple use cases. So one is assessing, uh, different human verification methods. Uh, and another is aggregating so that we can, uh, for example, uh, assess uh, SMS verification, GitHub accounts verification, Facebook, and have this multiple groups who curates users directly. And now we can create groups that curate other groups. So they don't curate users directly. And those groups can potentially have very high price of forgery costs. Uh, you know, basically unlimited. Uh, uh, we can have, for example, a price of forgery of million dollars, maybe for some super uh, reputation heavy services like oracles, nodes, and stuff like that, maybe judges, uh, so that we require them to pass a lot of human verification methods with high price of forgery. And by the way, in, in this, in this, uh, uh, in this area, like uh, Umphala is and price of forgery concept is a lot better than passports because passports mm -hmm. have their limited price of forgery, uh, which is also unknown. Uh, and we can do unlimited stuff. Got it. Okay. And, you know, what kind, what kind of stuff can we do? You said unlimited stuff. So what kind of stuff can we do? Yeah, as, as I said, like very reputation heavy uh, things like jurors, uh, mm -hmm. like all, all the an analogy of national state, uh, uh, like authorities on blockchains on, mm -hmm. on blockchain. Right. So that I mean that feels like governance to me. You know, I, it feels like governance of this system is going to be something that's pretty important to design elegantly on the on the back of it yeah uh think so think so as well but i, I don't know where that would go probably mm -hmm. there are there, there are other super cool hum, unique human methods around there being de developed right now so mm -hmm. we'll see yeah it feels like we're in this primordial soup in which everyone knows digital identity is important, but no one's really figured out how to build a sound digital identity system that's privacy preserving and sovereign that delivers utility to a user. And we're just kind of like on that precipice. So it, it's it's exciting yeah. once it starts happening, but I think everyone doesn't know really know which systems to bet on and which ones to integrate on. So, you know, I, I, I guess I, I guess I'm wondering, as you may have seen Gitcoin, which I've since disaffiliated from Gitcoin, from leadership in Gitcoin, but I'm still like contributing from the edges. Uh, Gitcoin announced Gitcoin Passport last week, which is basically a way of getting different stamps from different identity verification systems. And basically the, the, the idea is to inform the trust bonus that you get on Gitcoin grants when you contribute to a Gitcoin grants round. And, you know, I'm wondering, if anyone from Gitcoin DAO is listening to this, or if anyone who's just following digital identity in the ecosystem and needs civil resistance is listening to this, how might they integrate with Upala in order to derive the civil resistance or the identity signals that are that are coming out of Upala? Yeah. <clears throat> I um, basically I'm developing right now Upala just for Gitcoin as like first uh, user. 
<laughs> yeah, right. I think we have uh, the most the, the the most possible synergy behind the project. Uh, so, uh, as as I see it, uh, the 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 coolest advantage of using price of forgery concept and Opala for Gitcoin is evaluating uh, different human verification methods that are already there that are involved in trust bonus calculation. So with Opali and price of forgery concept, we can assess them at least uh, like from the quality side, how they relate to each other. And at most, we will find the actual price of forgery for all those methods. Right. And that okay. would be and that would be beneficial for the whole ecosystem. Yeah. If we find out that those if we find out that Bright ID has like thousand dollars price of forgery, that would mean a lot, I think. Yeah. So it feels like one of the things that I've sort of learned from this this space is that you can build like the perfect, most like academically sound civil resistance tool or identity tool, but if no one ever uses it, it never really has an impact on the world. So there's this cycle between impact and usage. And and maybe one of the ways that Gitcoin, which has a bunch of usage and is still getting civil resistance and Upala, which has this beautiful system for creating cost of forgery can work together is by integrating. So Gitcoin will send users over to Apollo and then Upala will issue civil resistance back and forth. And it kind of becomes this positive sum synergistic relationship from there. And, you know, I'm not sure other ways to set it up for success, but I know that the Gitcoin DAO is working on adding a lot of stamps to Passport right now. And so maybe there's an opportunity there. Sure. For, for sure. That's that's a great opportunity. Yeah. Well, I'm realizing now as I'm asking these questions that I'm basically representing the stakeholders who listen at Gitcoin DAO here, but I'm maybe not representing the rest of the ecosystem all that well. So say I'm a member of the ecosystem that has done some DGEN stuff, has done some DAO stuff, and I'm interested in getting an Upala ID. Like, what can, what can I do now? Is there a website that I can go to? And and how would I onboard into the system now? Uh, for f Right now, uh, uh, deployed... Uh, Upala deployed uh, only MVP part, so it meant to be totally invisible for users. So at this stage, we are concerned only with uh, price of forgery, of on, only with discovering this uh, price of forgery stuff. And I also don't like. Uh, um, uh, there is no no such. There is no user interface now, so. Um, we will only uh, like aggregating information now, right? And uh, yeah, Opal, and there is no no uh, for for a user. There's no such thing as Opala ID. There is Opala ID only for for those who want to liquidate. And MVP actually is called Group Managers versus Bots. So it's only for this uh, this battle. So it's the first battle right. of bots and group managers <laughs> got it are, are all but so not all civil attackers are bots though I, I don't know if anyone's seen these pictures of people that have like 100 cell phones in front of them and you oh, basically yeah, yeah. pay someone like ten dollars an hour in order to go through and in, in civil attack all these things right so it's not, it, as far as i know it's not always bots uh, to, to to me it's like it's the same thing it's uh, uh it's not it's not a human so it's a bot got it like, not a real account Anyway, no, right. no matter what tech is under the hood, uh, is it like men on a bicycle or <laughs> <laughs> or a script? Yeah, it's got it. So, so what I heard from your answer there is that uh, Upala is running its first sort of like red team, blue team exercise. Uh, red team, blue team just means adversaries that are attacking a crypto economic system and the blue team is like the defenders of the system. And, and, and that's happening very soon, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, uh, Upala is ready, and all, all is needed right now. All is needed is just to like uh, export all users uh, to Upala and put some funds in the pool and mm. see the explosions, the liquidations. Right. Got it. And start you know this this uh, price of forgery discovery. Yeah. 
mechanism. No, no. Okay. So say in a hypothetical future that I am a Gitcoin grants user, I've set up my passport in order to contribute to Gitcoin grants. There's uh there's basically a data export that would be on the back end for for the passport where some of the the privacy preserving user information would be uploaded into Paula. And then anyone could go in and could sort of consume and liquidate their identity from there. And so is is that more or less correct? Yeah. Um, like we're just just exporting data. Some uh, publish somewhere our intentions mm. to create a honeypot for bots and like try to uh, attract more as more as as much bot, as, as many bots as we can. Right. So um, do you think it's only going to be bots or adversaries that are going to want to consume their identities? Like say I'm Kevin Iwaki and I started Gitcoin. And because of that, I have a ton of cost of forgery because I've been doing stuff on chain for four years. Like what if I just want to make 200 bucks and I want to consume my <laughs> my identity or something like that? You know, uh, is, is that a use case that you've kind of thought through? Uh, so uh, I'm I'm currently trying to figure out the ways that uh, price of forgery mechanism could be uh, more, even more helpful for Gitcoin because uh, I now separate this uh, like this price of forgery stuff like how much does it cost to forge those accounts and there is another thing which is extracted value from Gitcoin. Uh, so mm. what are you hunting for, for Bitcoin value or for this price of forgery value and how those right. are connected? There is some, there should be some like simple, I think there's, there is some simple connection and we can some way, some way extract keep some, at least some KPI from there. Uh, but, uh, um, it, it's totally fine if someone will try to to explode or liquidate their id so i, I right. think um, it's okay to have some liquidations and uh, i hope we will uh, have um, more uh, liquidations from both sides uh, so that we can have some statistics some better statistics Right. Okay. Yeah. I was just sort of curious about that, that economic game. Like some people aren't attacking the system, but once they realize there's a $300 airdrop on the other end of, of, of things, <laughs> they would just consume their identity. Cause you know, maybe, maybe that's, that's a payday for them. They got to meet some short term need, but yeah. I, I think that basically there has to be a consequence to doing that. So maybe you can't contribute to Gitcoin grants or anything in the Gitcoin passport network anymore. Once you've consumed that ID and you're kind of sure. like blacklisted, you're starting from zero again from there. So yeah, I don't know, sure. that's, that's what comes to mind for me, but. that That's definitely so. So, uh, but it's on the. It's not on Upala side. Upala will just tell you who who liquidated and, and for how much, and then you decide what you can do with this address in the future. So will mm -hmm. you not uh, like will you refuse this address to register, or maybe you will require them to refund, yeah, <laughs> and get their get their ID back. Maybe some people been hacked or yeah, it's liquidated by mistake. This feels really synergistic to Gitcoin grants where basically there's $3 million worth of economic activity over time. And there's the uh, there's a whole infrastructure there of, of stamps and passports. And there's a fraud analysis team that's analyzing these things. But it almost feels like a really interesting like diplomatic tool between the blue team and the red team to just be able to put out this honeypot that's like, hey, yeah. here's a hundred bucks if you can get to this. And then you mm -hmm. base, but what you're doing is the, it's a honeypot. So the civil attackers are, revealing themselves to the blue team and yeah. over time the blue team gets stronger because of that and it, it, in a short term it feels like you're giving up a lot by giving up a hundred dollars but on the long-term adversarial game you're actually gaining a lot in in way of a, a, insights by setting up this game sure sure uh and both both sides will increase their technologies but that would actually mean that we have a higher price of forgery over time so we we will have better tools to find bots and bots will all, uh, constantly improve their skills so it's like uh in, in 
in the long term, it should increase, it should always increase price of forgery. Mm. And, and by the way, uh, you uh, oh, like from, from your side, I hear the term cost of forgery. Uh, mm. uh, and from my side, it's price of forgery. So mm. maybe I should please, like uh, describe some more here, some thoughts. Uh, right. Uh, I, yeah. So I would say, say more about the difference between those two things. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that uh, the the right term is price of forgery, um, mm. as uh, like as it is mentioned in this paper called. Uh, Who watches the Watchman? Oh, um, that's that. That one's canon by Paula Berman, Berman yeah. and uh, and Santi from Proof of Humanity. Uh, uh, we yeah. basically built built the whole Getcoin trust bonus system off of that. But uh, okay, I will update my uh, up, update the way I speak about it. Then, <laughs> if you think that that's the right way to go, uh, yeah, we uh, wrote this paper together, and um, I, I really like uh, think that the right the difference is that cost of forgery doesn't assume some like profit for the bot. So if we are exploding just for the cost of forgery, we don't get the profit. But if we explode for the price of forgery, we have this like margin and we have this profit. But yeah, that's that's an open question actually. Like, uh... Right. Yeah. <laughs> But I think the better the better term would be a price of forgery. The Opera Crypto Browser is the world's first web browser built for the crypto community. With Web3 support and a non-custodial wallet, Opera lets you access DeFi apps quickly and easily. The Opera wallet has buy, sell, and swap features, and of course lets you view your beautiful NFTs. But the browser still lets you use any crypto wallet extension you prefer, giving you the choice and flexibility for the Web3 world. Opera lets you view and manage all of your assets across all the blockchains all at once, and offers seamless multi-chain support between Ethereum, Bitcoin, Polygon, Binance Exchange, and other EVMs and Layer 2s. But Opera goes even deeper than that. Opera has a built-in homepage for crypto natives with the Opera Crypto Corner with price charts, news feeds, NFT updates to make sure you are always on top of your game. And it even has Discord and Telegram integrated natively into the browser. That's crazy. Opera is truly building the battle station for the crypto world. Check out Opera both on mobile with Android and iOS apps and on desktop too. Refi summer has arrived and Celo is here for it. Celo is the layer one blockchain for the regenerative finance movement. It's fast, planet positive, and built for the real world. Celo has committed towards producing a sustainable future from the very beginning and is the world's first carbon negative EVM compatible layer one blockchain. Celo has become much more than a technology, a currency, a community, or even just a layer one. Celo is a movement to create conditions of prosperity for everyone. You can soon engage with all of this via green asset Uniswap pools on Celo, benefiting reforestation and other regenerative products through the Toucan protocol, Moss, and more. ReFi is also about the health of communities and Resource Network is creating bankless infrastructure for circular trade and mutual credit networks to benefit small businesses and local economies all on Celo. Follow along on Twitter to learn more about how Celo is accelerating ReFi summer for a positive impact on people, communities, and the planet. If you're attending ECC, visit the Celo Saloon to learn about what's happening on the front lines of ReFi from industry experts. So, so... Take us further down this rabbit hole. I mean, what else is there to discover in the Apollo universe? You know, what continues to drive you working on this? What's next? Uh, where's your head at? Uh, yeah, the um, I think uh, it's good to mention other use cases possible. What, what I foresee in the nearest future. So when we um, when we pass this uh, stage of MVP and start with. Uh, uh, Upala, the real Upala ID that could be used in services. Uh, uh, we, we already have, by the way, this uh, domain multipassport.eth. So mm. you, you can remember that and try from time to time if it is working. Mm. Uh, so when we have this uh, UX, uh, other use cases uh, besides quality control is, score, of course, score providing. Uh, so that Opala can be used in well, like like Gitcoin, uh, like Gitcoin Passport. It can, it would it could, could it would be possible to use Opala's ID in other apps. It will also be possible to use uh, uh, for. Uh, so this is the score provider. Uh, 
use case. The other use case is core consumer uh, is on, on the app side. And another use case is score prosumer. It is, this is Gitcoin, uh, meaning that you digest different human verification methods and then provide your own better score based on some uh, other interactions within your platform. So this is core pr prosuming. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is other stuff, uh, which I call identity bridge. Uh, with Opala, we can instantly bridge other identity systems to any other blockchain, uh, starting with Ethereum. For example, we can instantly bridge BrightID to Ethereum or bridge IDENA to Ethereum or any other blockchain uh, really instantly. Uh, then there is a cool use case of using Opala ID as collateral. Uh, right now, we only ha can have a un un uh, over collateralized loans on Ethereum, but mm. with Opala, we can like stake our ID and say that if we don't repay our loan, please liquidate liquidate me and get your money. And this unlocks this uh, uh, collateral stuff. Right. Blockchain. So quite an expansive set of primitives, it seems like the different people building on regenerative society, decentralized society could do bridging from chain to chain, the ability to consume scores, the ability to create scores at at, at scale, what does this sort of hyperstructure look like? You know, what's what's sort of your 10-year vision? If you're maximally successful in 10 years, what it, what it, what does the world look like? How does it differ? Well, uh, like su super successful uh, scenario is having real digital identities or identities and of course governments. So that, that's the hope to let people coordinate. Uh, and I think that's really comes in alignment with what blockchains can do. So mm -hmm. what the way I see blockchains is that we scaling the whole world to down to the level of a tribe so that we can have same relations as we had when we lived in tribes. So they're meaning trustless mm. and we have repeated games right. uh, between each other. So there's a there's sort of a Dunbar's number thing in there where there's five people that I can have intimate relationships with, 15 that I can have strong relationships, yeah, yeah. 50 casual, 500. Or I forget exactly what the upper limit of Dunbar's yeah, number is, like but that. you're basically envisioning the level of coordination that we've been able to have with smaller groups of people, with larger groups of people, once we have digital identity and more positive sum creation games is sort of how I interpret your your vision for what could be what could be done here well yeah that yeah that's 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 the goal to to scale down the um, social institutes down to tri tribal level hmm. quite beautiful and I, I I think that there's just a, a lot of really opportunity here for building in the space, but it seems like it's been really hard to get a lot of these digital identity systems going. There's a network effect to them where the more people use them, the more people use them, the more dApps mm -hmm. use them, yeah. the more people use them. And so spinning that that network is, I think, what we the positive sum game that Gitcoin and Apollo and Bread ID and Proof of Humanity and everyone else in this space can spin together. I don't know if yeah, you have anything sure. to say about that about that layer of the game. Oh yeah, that's um, that's again the beauty of blockchains because there is no competition. I I really like can't stop wondering how uh, organically synergies emerge in blockchain space. So mm -hmm. we really we just can't cannot compete. The only thing we can do is to cooperate on blockchain. So the better system we build, the the better systems we build the more all of us like benefit yeah and, and the whole society benefits too yeah is it do you think it's a change of system thing or is it a change of self thing uh or is it both oh that's a cool question uh i think that's that that's both 
Yeah. And yeah, I like I, I think about it a lot. And I think that's uh we live in very, very <laughs> interesting time. Like it's super singularity right now. Mm -hmm. we, I think humanity never had a, a, such a rapid change in social constructs uh, in history. So this blockchain stuff is like super changing. Uh, yeah. What makes me optimistic about it is that it's a fundamentally... It feels like we're moving into this information age in which a lot of us are creators and consumers of information and there's our, our data is our labor and in the what we do on the internet is a, in a lot of ways our impact on the world and one of the things that makes me really excited about this digital identity and civil resistance stuff is that we're kind of building new not we but the web3 space is kind of building new institutions that are going to be fundamentally future forward almost yeah. everything in the future of humanity is going to be internet connected and the opportunity to build sure. high resolution democracy and social systems that support each other at web scale seems very high. And there's this fertile crescent that is the Ethereum and blockchain space, which is where, where those institutions are going to be built. So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really going to be a big leap from the industrial age to the information age, but it seems like there's high upside if, if we make the leap. For sure. And I like the term high resolution de democracy. Never heard that before. That's yeah. That's a cool term. You gotta subscribe to the Green Pill Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yep. All right. Well, is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? Mm, um well, uh, there's one one use case I didn't mention, but it's like a my I, I consider it minor one. It's better capture for web2 like but probably it could be a huge uh, use case yeah. in terms of uh, getting user base yeah so if we start from there we can like start attracting users from traditional web into web3 yeah yeah i think that there's a lot of opportunity there and 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 the more that you can do once you have a web3 wallet the better and that's one of the upsides sure. i see of these digital identity systems they don't cost much to set up a bright id or a gitcoin passport or a proof of humanity but then once you're on the other side there's a bunch of cool stuff that you can do you can kind of take sure. it's it's like a magic wand you can take and wave around and get utility yeah um there's one thing that actually comes to mind for me and that's that I, i've listened to vitalik talk a lot about in order to design systems that are anti-fragile in the information age you have to make it uh more cost efficient to defend those systems than to attack the systems yeah. and and i'm wondering how you think about that in the context of civil resistance in apollo because uh it seems to me that you know with proof of stake this is where vitalik talks about you stake your 32 eth and it's more from there this system can slash you if or attest penalties if you do something that's not good and and that makes the system much much cheaper to defend than to attack and i'm wondering how you think about that within the context of civil resistance it, it seems like it's not scalable to give out hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of like bounties or liquidations in in return for these identities but maybe the data that you get creates like a new iteration of the game which makes it cheaper over time i, I don't know if you thought about it in these terms at all but this is one of the terms that i'm starting to think about these adversarial games within uh that's interesting actually i didn't think any, from from this side uh like um i imagine upala as a more like a assessing tool for and they like uh, uh the thing that creates this motivation to make the tools better the the simple resistance tool and bots tools mm -hmm. so it's it's like it's on the side from 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 this uh uh from this um uh, terminology yeah uh, what i think is important is cre is creating is 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 uh, creating some better stuff to manage your uh, manage your accounts and uh, mm. your your blockchain accounts and from that it will create better tools to managing your ids right 
so like that that's that's the the mode of thinking got it okay that's quite interesting well uh is there anything i didn't ask that you want to say i think i asked you that once already but then we went down this rabbit hole of efficiency <laughs> so is there anything else that you want to say um no that's i think we covered pretty much um yeah. if anyone's interested uh please uh proceed to upala dashboard and see there right and anyone can also have a call with me if okay. you have ideas and cool and, and where can people out. find you online twitter twitter handles domain names stuff like that yeah uh, everything so I, I will insert it or sh should i sh should i put it in the chat yeah that's my twitter yeah, so maybe say it out loud so that people who are audio only can hear it, and then we'll also put it in the chat, which will become the show notes. Okay, uh, it's my, my handle in Twitter is parabov uh, underscore p, so p o r o b o v underscore p. Uh, Peter for Peter, uh, and Upala, uh, it's v Upala. Amazing. Well, Peter, thanks so much for being on the Green Pill Pod. Really bullish on digital identity. And I know that you are sure. also. And hopefully we'll see Gitcoin Passport and Opala do an integration in the future. And and yeah. uh, looking forward to a very positive sum game on multi-levels here. So thanks yeah, again. That would be really, really cool. <laughs> and Cheers. yeah, let's let's move society to a better version of it. <laughs> yeah, to a regenerative society. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for hey. having me. Bye-bye.